Hello. With me today is a snooker player who's recorded two major victories on the snooker circuit. Uh, the pin-up of the 80 snooker players by far, and also a gentleman who's inflicted the worst defeat of my career at the World Championships at the Crucible, Mr Tony Knowles. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I've got to get this out of the way, right, because it's been on my mind for years and years, and we never had a chance to chat about it. But in 1981, I won the World Championship and I had a successful year and became uh, overnight success in my own right. And I came to the next year as hot, hot favourite to win again the World Championships. And I was expected to beat my first round opponent, who the public didn't know. I knew he was a good player, but the public didn't know the name of Tony Knowles. What happened on that day? <laughs> well, as, as the public doesn't know, Steve, uh, over the last the few years previous to that, uh, we'd grown up on the, uh, the amateur circuit and you turned professional uh, just slightly before myself and Jimmy and Tony Mayo. And uh, I'd been playing quite well on the amateur circuit that last year and um, I fancied myself uh, to uh, go quite well in that match. Um, I, I remember the first frame, <coughs> I, there's some things you remember, I, I'll tell you what my memories of it, right? First frame, I remember being very scrappy. I remember potting a couple of decent balls, but not getting positional play. And then all of a sudden, I lost the first frame, and then uh, you looked like a god on the table, you never missed a ball. Well, a rather desperate effort by Steve oh, for a snooker there, that. knowing that it's a pretty hopeless task. But one cannot take away from Tony Knowles a truly magnificent performance. Yeah. Well, he won't be worrying about the black. So that is 8 1 to Tony Knowles, a truly magnificent performance. And Tony shakes hands with Steve. What a session for Tony. One of the things I bet you don't realise is that my highest break in that match was probably only about 32. Really? Throughout the whole, uh, how many, 11 frames. And uh, <coughs> one of my strategies after seeing you play the previous year was that your game was such, such a controlled game that you didn't give your opponents uh, many openings. Right. So my strategy in that particular time, although I was a, an attacking player, was to actually try and play the similar style game as yourself. All right. So therefore, I actually... Uh, you outthought I, me. I actually tried to put you on the top cushion behind the green spot and, and keep you there. And, and that was my strategy, and it worked. Uh, and that's why I only had a very low average break. Well, mm. I, I, I remember the whole match as a nightmare. I mean, obviously, well, you, you, you obviously have another story. But I remember <clears> just thinking as if I was being outplayed and also as if it was out of my control. And I mean, that probably was the reason why. Well, um, I didn't really take any chances in the match. Uh, and, and as I say, my strategy was to not let any openings and lose control of the, of the frames. And, and as the frames kept uh, building up, the first one, the second one, uh, when the openings did come to yourself, they were very difficult to uh, to sort of gain position. And pro probably by then, all of a sudden, I'd started to, to fall away a bit. Well, you, you, you obviously, your, your confidence in the game was, was going slightly, uh, and, and mine was growing. So I, I'm, I'm sure, you're, and you're very right, because, I mean, uh, I always felt as if, as a player, and it's been mentioned by some other people that have come on the programme, um, and I think Terry Griffiths summed up my style of play as a player who would perhaps be a vulture, would wait for other people's mistakes... Prey on your opponent, and, yeah. ..and slowly strangle players. So. Well, uh, from, watching you, from watching your game at that particular time, is you, you used to let players actually attack the, uh, the balls and uh, leave the opening. Commit to suicide. Well, sort of, if you didn't finish the game off or you didn't get that many points on the board, if you were still sort of... you were 50-odd behind in the frame, you were still favourite to win, the, to win that frame. Yeah, because tactically, the, I felt tactically, quite... Tactically, yeah, at the back end good. of the game, with five reds on the table, you were probably unbeatable. Yes. And it was to do with your control. So you decided to change your natural style... Yeah, to in that one, for that one that particular match, yeah. Then, then, then the question... I mean, I, I, well, perhaps it'd be, 
you may be able to ask this better than me then, why, why, if you got success that way, um, well, did I, you not continue that for the rest of the tournament or you well, opened it, out? I, I obviously, it was a strategy for that actually particular match because obviously I wanted to get up the ranking list and, 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 and sort of uh, the only way to do that was to, in them days, was to win tournaments in the world and the UK. Right, because we had a, at we the had time major, we had, we only had two we, tournaments. We only had world. tournaments that we could play in. We used to have two tournaments that were <coughs> ranked. So if you didn't do well in those, you wouldn't go to the ranking right. list. Exactly. So therefore, all the, all the thinking was was on them two particular matches. Where did you end up in that particular uh, tournament? Well, the next round I uh, I played uh, was it uh, Graham Miles, and I beat him, and I lost to Eddie Charlton when I was actually seven frames in front. Oh. I was there was probably nine frames to play. I was seven frames in front, and I lost against Steady Eddie. Uh, against he outsteadied uh, you. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Oh no! I suppose by that time you thought you were going to beat Eddie and was playing well, attacking. Well, probably again. this time I, I'd reverted back to my old style, and uh, the games kept clicking on. You know. So I didn't see all of that because I, <coughs> for, for the next week and a half, I, I was my life was an alcoholic blur. Yeah, uh, well, it know, wasn't my life fell apart. It, but you, you're all of a sudden, you were the centre of attention. Well, it wasn't until was the like? following year that uh, in the World Championships again that I felt that my game had, had gained from the experience of the year before in getting through a few rounds. Right. Uh, and I felt as if I was one of the best players in the world at that particular time in 1983, and, and, and probably my best chance of uh, winning the World Championships. And that was, was when I lost to Cliff Thorburn in the semi-final, um, when I was three frames in front again. And uh, you reached, yes. I needed one out of the last three frames, and I lost 16-15. And three, the winner yeah. had to play yourself. Now, I th I, I, my thinking is that if I'd have actually won that match and beaten you the year before, it would probably been my best chance of... Uh... Be well, because you, you're always a very confident player, I felt. It's yeah, very hard to judge table. somebody else. On, on the table, you, you never used to... Um, uh, you, you took on a lot of balls that other players wouldn't go for at the time. You know, yeah. you, uh, in, in much the same way as Jimmy White, and perhaps Jimmy White and yourself were the attacking players at the time. Yeah. But... Um, People remem remember the 10 1 victory, but unfortunately, three semi finals you got to three semi finals in the world right, championship. Three semi finals, ranked uh, unbeat by the winner, yes, in most of them. Ranked number two in the world at one mm. stage, which is well, you can't get much higher than two in the world. Well, so you. you had, you had very, every cause to feel as if you're, you were very strong in the game. Uh, as I said, I felt like in 1983 was my best opportunity of actually winning the world championships, and uh. I missed a, I was 15, 13 in front to Cliff Thorburn and I was just on a straightforward clearance of the colours. Uh, and as you know, as you get into a certain position on the table, you think it's, you're just going to automatic overdrive and knock the balls in. But unfortunately, what I didn't realise is that the pink was two inches off its own spot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the normal position for potting the blue would be to play just short of the... The straight line with the line of the, the blue of spot, the, of yeah, the blue the spot uh, knock the blue into the middle pocket and come off the bottom cushion with a trace of check side. Yeah, and and then a straight pink into the corner. But when I actually got down to play the shot off the blue, it was then I realised that the pink was two inches off its spot towards the middle pocket, so you couldn't play that shot. The extra two inches could make all the difference. Well, I couldn't see the cushion. Yeah, of course. I, I could only see it towards the corner pocket, and I ended up playing the same same shot as I normally do, off the bottom cushion with check side, and it, and I ended up on the cushion uh, for the black to to play a straight pink in the corner, which was made the pink a lot more difficult. And the shot I really should have played was to drop in behind the pink and play <laughs> right. the, play the pink in the middle pocket. It would have been easy, and that was the the shot which turned the whole match. Yeah. yeah. But then, of course, you won ranking tournaments. Um, you won, uh, you won the, um, the Jameson, which was a ranking tournament in 80. Yeah, no, I won the Jameson in 82. 80, right, and yes. I won the... It was, but I played the professional players that, that year early, early on in the season. I won the professional players early in the, the season of that year. There was a time um, I noticed, I thought your cue action became better than it, than it was. You'd improved your cue action. And there was a time when... You seemed to be in total control of, of hitting the ball. You were pulling 
the, the cue back on the, the final backswing you were pulling it back so slowly you, it looked like you were in total control and that oh. was that coincided when you were I thought you were most dangerous right but I mean, it's things you don't you don't know whether somebody's Probably doing it deliberately. That, yeah. Well, it, well, in some ways, when somebody is in total control, they feel like they've got all the time in the world to do things. Well, I I used to feel the way that I played, or the the best way that I I played was was to actually as soon as I thought of the shot, was to to get down, make one one complete strike, w one uh, waggle, one yeah. waggle, or whatever, whatever you call them, and, and then straight through and play the shot. And that way you built up that sort of uh, rhythm which our attacking players needed to play the game. We, we were sort of the, the rat pack behind Willie Thorne and That's John Virgo right, and Patsy yeah. Fagan. We were the new breed coming through. The there young, was myself. The young guns. Yeah, the young guns. There was <laughs> myself. Uh, Tony Mayo. Jimmy White. Jimmy White. Mike Joe Hallett, Johnson. Joe Mike Johnson. Hallett. And we'd all, we'd all sort of grew up with Alex Higgins' style. Now, actually, when I was playing, as I said, when I was playing in the clubs in Bolton, I was looked after by a guy called, who was called Mr. Snooker. He was a, was a referee, a grade-A referee called Jim Worsley. And it, they had something to do with the World Championships or organising of the World Championships right. or refereeing when, when the... the, the, the embassy, sorry, when the World Championships was actually sponsored by players number six. Uh, and a lot of the qualifying rounds were played in Bolton, obviously because of John Spencer's time in the game. Did, did John Spencer have any input into your game? Well, uh, actually, it, uh, Jim Worsley, he knew John, and he'd been to a lot of matches, and I went down to his club playing, and um, he actually brought Alex Higgins over from Ireland to play in, um, when he was an amateur, to play in an inter-counties uh, an international match between, I think it was Wales, playing Ireland uh, at the Bolton Technical College, and he, he, he asked me to come down and watch this young player from Ireland. So I went down, and, and he was only playing, uh, I think, what, one or two frames, you know, in the team event. And it was the year, it was about six months after that that he challenged uh, John Spencer, who was then the world champion, in Bolton over uh, so many days. And he beat him with a 14-point start or seven-point start, and it, it was that was the start of uh, of sort of coming the up. The new type of players, and yeah, new type of players, and coming up a level. So, so do you, I mean, obviously, it's difficult to talk about standards and different eras, okay? But the, I don't know how you feel you're playing today, um, as we I speak. I feel as though I've changed my old style and and where you play the game today. But do you feel then that the start, the standard of play you were playing in the 80s, which was, which was a style that has now been cop not copied, but but has been played by a lot of 90s players of seeing a shot, getting down, playing it a lot quicker than the older players. You, you, the, your game would have been not too bad in today's market. Uh, my game would have been okay if I'd actually started to learn the game with the actual equipment that they're playing with today. What, what, sorry, when what I, when I say that, if you started to play on the tables that they're playing on today with the finer cloth and the, uh, the, the more responsive reaction from the balls, it's a totally tif different uh, um, timing and striking of the ball today. It's a different shot completely. Right. So it's not good enough to just practice on, on a fine cloth in a club? I think most of the players are actually playing on, are practicing on, on, on tables which are similar to what they play on in matches today. And if you don't do that, you cannot sort of. Uh, right. Uh, but so, the so then the, the, the 80s players that grew up on the thicker cloth. On a club table. On a club table, have this, no chance playing on today's tables in a way. Yeah, sort of, yeah. It's yeah. a big transformation to come on from one it, to I mean, the other. It's a, it's a different game. Yeah, you, if, you you haven't, if you don't know about the actual transformation from one table to the other and you can adapt and you know it's going to happen, it's very difficult. It's just the same when, in the old days, we played with, um, with crystal... When I started, I played with bronzoline and crystallate balls. The heavier ball. The heavier ball and you had to, you had to be a good cueist to be able to manoeuvre them balls. It was very difficult. So therefore, you had to have a good degree of timing. In other words, allowing the weight of the cue into the ball, so so that you could get a reaction from it. But nowadays, the the stroke of the shot is so light 
You're still competing. Playing oh, I'm still competing, yeah. In tournaments. I, I feel as though now it's taken like a, a few years and I'm pre uh, a little bit of a t at a time. I'm, I'm getting better on the, the tables that they're playing on today. Your current ranking is 93. Oh, I, I, well, I, I had a very good season last year, f you know, for f the way I was playing. I uh, won all my first round matches and I, I, went, up a, I went up a section. Yeah. But this year I've had a bit, I've, I feel as though I'm playing better, but I've not had the results. Do you think the players are better? I think the players are far better. So they're more consistent. I feel I feel that as if the players are, are actually at the moment there's a there's a growing number of actually players in uh, of actual players in the qualifying rounds, which are of a similar standard or if not better standard than the ones who are above them, because they're competing more and and the more uh, the more tuned into the nine frame match. Yeah, style. yeah, I understand that. Yeah, and I feel when you get when you go up a bracket to this next level, you you get starved of match play snooker. Well, well a lot of people say that the seeding system does affect that. You know, that if you do, even if you're brought in at say the last 32 mm. of a tournament, that yeah, you're playing well, that, players that have played two or three matches I beforehand. I feel as if you're you're caught between 17 and 32 in the rankings. You're in a real vulnerable position because if you get stuck there for too long, then psychologically you're losing takes over I'm in the 17 to 32 bracket at yeah the moment, but at the moment the no, you, you're actually not yeah you provision because of the two because of the two-year uh, list you actually started off in in the top 16 but you're you're now in the in the area where if you start from that position next year you could become vulnerable exactly yes so anyway uh, you weren't certainly vulnerable in uh, in 1982 when you gave oh, no, me no, a no, good no. hiding <laughs> and there weren't that many players around there weren't that many young players around and of no, course you came right. on the scene and in, uh, there was Alex Higgins of course but but uh, well, we all look, we all looked at Al Alex Higgins as a new style and a new breath of fresh air in the game but you came on the circuit not me bandy 10-1 <laughs> instantly became a recognizable face in the street mm, uh, yep. you had a bit of panache about you yeah, I mean, let's face it, you were spinning the old queue, right? And you became nice. an overnight, whether you want to talk about it or not, you became an overnight pin-up in the right. snooker world. Well, the snooker yeah. was big news then. Well, that's, that's the main thing. The snooker, snooker had suddenly taken over from 1982 right up until probably 1986, where it started to decline a little. How, how did you feel about, A, the, the attention you got from beating me and also then the attention from, from other areas who were looking at you not just as a snooker player? I feel as though uh, all I wanted to do at that particular time was actually compete at snooker and play snooker in my own style. Right. Uh, and I suppose uh, Jimmy and Alex and Joe Johnson and players with an attacking style feel as though they, it was the nine frames snooker suddenly sort of the control took over and not the sort of flamboyance of the game. Right. And the, the, sorry, the more, the more shots you had, the more vulnerable you were to be being beaten within that nine frame um, framework. But away from the table, we all got attention. We all got more attention. Um, some people got more attention than others. <laughs> I got this theory, right? Okay, now yeah, this, this is my theory. Yeah. Okay, that, that the, the people that end up winning the most. The, 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 the cream of the snooker, uh, not the snooker world, the sport, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, the best sportsmen in the world are going to be ugly, right? Because <laughs> nobody wants to know them. They've got, no, they've got nothing, they've got no, they, they don't have a social life. I never had a social life, ugly, right? Okay, so there I am um, when I'm sort of 14, 15, 16, 17 years of old. My mate's saying, you're coming out down a night, local nightclub, right? And I go, no, I'm, I'm not going to go because I'm going to practice. I'm going to yeah. practice the break off, okay? Yeah. OK, because basically, not because I wanted to play snooker all the time, but I, I didn't want to have a knockback, yeah. right? But then you come along the pin-up world, right, OK? You got all the attention. I was world <laughs> champion at the time, but you yeah. got immediate attention. You must have enjoyed it a bit. I did, I did. I enjoyed it tremendously. And, uh, but at that particular time, I did most of my practising down in the billiard hall between when I was 12 and when I was 18. <laughs> Right. And, uh, and, and, and with my father having uh, or running the steward of a, a conservative club, we, I was on the tables all the time during the day. So in the night time, between when I was older and I was at college, I had a, a good social life before I actually beat you in the 1981. Right. Well, I didn't have and a social life till I was about 40. I can't remember when, but <laughs> the, 
a strange thing happened, uh, um, uh, that, that happened to you, and I, I'm not going to talk about it because it, it's not that type of program, but strangely strange right. happened to you was that you had an article that was written in one of the tabloid newspapers That's right, yeah. that, that was about your personal life. Okay, and what happened? And the, the thing I want to ask about I'll is, talk about this. You know, what anyway. happened was the, the Snooker Association fined you five thousand pounds, pounds for yeah. bringing the game into, into disrepute. And it wasn't my doing. You were, oh, well, it wasn't your doing, perhaps, but, but you weren't talking about snooker. No, no, we never brought snooker into it. So did you? It. So did you ever? Did you Challenge pay the it. money? Did you ever get? Did yeah, you, it was what happened? It, the money was paid. Yeah. And, and you, I, I mean, I personally thought it was completely out of order that you had to pay in the first place because it yeah. was nothing to do with the association. Yeah, it was, uh, I'll tell you how it started. Um, just before, you know, when the World Championships, it comes around the World Championships again, the qualifiers, the media build-up builds up. Yes, yeah, quite uh, very big before the uh, world. Big before the world, they, they sort of like look at the faces who actually can be on the trophy. And so they, they pick them out and they do, do a profile. Now, with mine, obviously, in 1983, I, I obviously felt that I should have had the, my best chance of winning the World Championships. So the following year, they obviously make me one of the favourites. Yeah. Um, and it was that year. Now, before the World Championships, I was involved with the management group up in, in the north. We'll, we'll leave them out of it. But the point is that talks were going on between the tabloid newspaper and they wanted to do uh, a look-alike with myself and shaking stevens all right yeah because i've since yeah. looked at him and i think oh, Pinelli looks like me and yeah, and, and he yeah. does a very very close resemblance so so we uh, the we sorry we're going to do this article and he's going to actually dress up as a snooker player, right. and I've got to dress up in the jeans and jean jacket and the eye colour and, and, and sort of swap roles and do a centre spread. <coughs> anyway, before that article took place, they started to get fan, the, the fan mail was sort of building up. They wanted to see me and... Sacks. Sack loads. <laughs> <laughs> sort of there. And they wanted to see me in the, uh, in the paper, and, uh, and what took over was this this sort of uh, profile about uh, groupies following snooker. And it started from there, and they lost total control of the article. And, and the instead management. of it being, yeah. Right. Because at the time, the person who was dealing with it was too busy being, going over to Malta signing up Tony Drago, who was a young kid playing around the tables in Malta. So the end result, uh, an article that, that, that was embarrassing. Was due, to, was due to sort of be published the same day that I played my first game. But, but, <coughs> I mean, and I hadn't even seen sight of the article, and this article ran for five days on the front page. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, there were, at that time, uh, snooker stars were a bit more like pop stars than they are perhaps even today, well, when well, there were then, plenty, then, yeah. of, plenty of uh, well, hangers-on around the circuit. I remember, I remember opening the club in, uh, in Liverpool in 1982 with Alex Higgins, just after he won the uh, World Championships. Right and they had to close the street off in the town centre of, I think it was in Bootle Street or somewhere down there, and uh, they closed all, they couldn't, you couldn't get through, it was like the Beatles arriving. Because I had the sort of, my facial expressions probably alienated a lot of people, I looked too aloof, okay, yeah. so the weirdest thing I got through the post, right, was a, was a nappy, full of uh, <laughs> what babies do in nappies. Good job. And, uh, and I put my hand in uh, one day to pick out what were the contents of opening my own fan mail, said, never oh, do it, no. okay? And I put it in and it, and there oh. it was. But I mean, you probably, I mean, fan mail, you must have had some weird things. Uh, nothing as weird as that. No? No. Oh, no. I can't think of, offhand, you've caught me there. No, never mind. Well, well, the, <coughs> the, the, uh, the celebrations of your, your, uh, your lifestyle continued into um, another field that I thought was fantastic, right? I mean, forgetting the fact... Well, first of all, just one, we'll go back, just one, one more thing about that. You say you paid the fine. You but yeah, paid the I fine. Paid. The, fine was, the fine was paid. Yeah. Why did you not challenge the fine? I'd, I, you know, I, I, I actually... It came out of... Uh, it was deducted, actually, from my management's money. Right. 
So you didn't so, really think so about it. So I didn't really think about it then. It was just when it. So I, I don't know whether I actually paid it or whether it was distributed over what they deducted from the management fee. Yeah, right. But, so, but, but it was actually paid too. Yes, but you still must have felt aggrieved that 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 you brought the game into disrepute where where a it was nothing to, to do. To be with quite Lucas. honest with you, dealing with the WPBSA was less of a <laughs> was was nothing compared to actually dealing with the press and the media at that particular right. time. So really then we're at the back of my mind. I felt as if my actual game had deteriorated from that point because of onwards. That. Yeah. Do you think being fit makes any difference to being a good snooker player? I think uh, snooker players are actually fit in their own sort of uh, in their own way. They're mentally strong and uh, they're what you call um, endurance wise fit. Right. They can stand at the bar for long hours. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they're not. They're they're but so okay, so like let's uh, let's take um, a physical wreck. Name a physical wreck snooker player. I mean, you know, probably there's plenty to choose from. Let's not pick a name. All let's right. say a snooker player who plays snooker, and the only part of his body that's probably in any t in muscles that are in any way, shape, or form legs, or possibly legs, but one one or two muscles in their in arm. arm. Yeah. Okay, and he's playing against. Let's say that's me. Yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, throughout the eighties, there I am. The only fit muscle in my is, is my is what is my forearm muscle, right? Somewhere right. down there, right? Okay. And I'm playing against you, and you're super fit by my by my standards. Oh, I'm not super fit. Well, I'm, to be in I'm, superstars, I mean, we're talking relatively super yeah, but fit. Yeah, not, not on. Not, not, not on the. No, I don't do any training at all. I bet you do more training than I do. But no, in the eighties, though, did you? Not really. I I I owned a I owned a, uh, a bicycle which I, I went out on. I, I you know I did cycling sometimes like 10 15 miles in a day. What well, do you think? I, um, but, uh, that's not a lot on a bicycle. And then I was just regular swimming in the summer. But I did. But you have, didn't I, abuse I, your body. When I lived when I lived up in the lakes, I was actually water skiing nearly three or four times a week, which well, which which you need which does actually. Uh, Take a bit of well, fitness. you call yourself not fit, but by a snooker player's standards, you were. And then you see um, in the 80s two players who probably weren't as fit as they should have been, Alex Siggins and Jimmy White, two marvellous, marvellous players. Do you think they'd have been better players had they been not, you know, not I burning the candle I don't, at both ends? I don't think it would have actually uh, being fit would have actually um, made them improve the game. I think they were fit in their own way. Uh, Alex Siggins. Uh, endurance wise they they could probably play snook of 20 or oh, oh, th straight through 24 hours 48 hours without sleep their, their fitness was was mental okay so and I think it still is what about as you get older I think people like J Jimmy White now he obviously doesn't look physically fit but uh, they, they, they don't tire very easily you know like you you, you get you get uh, people who are who are fit and who are training all, all day long, they need the sleep. They need, you know, they they need rest. Right. I don't think I think snooker players can go for long periods of times with uh, without that sort of rest. So concentration. They have concentration for eight, maybe ten hours sometimes. Snooker players. Yeah, they do. They're yeah. practicing. They're practicing all, more, all morning before they go out and play a match. They play for three, four hours, and then they, they sort of have a break and they're practicing again, and they go out for another three, four hours. That's a long day for anybody. That's like pure concentration for for a full day. But then today's world is everybody says if you're not fit, you're not. I'll tell you why. I'm asked the question because I feel this is, in your time you had more experience of being fit and playing snooker and knowing how it felt oh. to be in some sort of shape and playing snooker. Oh. So throughout the 80s, obviously, I was doing very well. And all of a sudden, yeah. the, a thing I wasn't. And it, whatever the reasons, then as, as time was going on, I thought, well, I'm getting older. Oh. Perhaps I should get fitter. Perhaps it's because I'm not fit. I know you did. I know you started. So doing I started. Some, I, I start, started training. Didn't I started, you? started training, doing some training, and I, I, I successfully did a half marathon, did you? and uh, and loved the experience. I'd recommend it to anybody as long as you're mm. in, you know, fit, you're fit and you, you get mm. tested beforehand. That it's a marvellous thing to try half and do. Half marathon. That would have been thirteen what, miles. Yeah. Did you do that in I, under two hours? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did yeah. one one hour fifty-seven minutes. One hour fifty-seven. Which is That's not bad. Fair. 
Yeah, because they reckon under four hours, isn't it, for a marathon? Yeah, but well, if you, if you if do it under four hours, you... So, but the question to you is, was I wasting my time to become a better snooker player? Probably, yeah. You might be right, because it didn't make a blind because bit of difference. Because it didn't make, wouldn't make any difference at all, because it's up... I think the concentration is more, more important. Uh, I did notice that you brought up the articles before, uh, you know, in 84 and 85, I, with the running I had with the press, and my game after that deteriorated. And I think what happened was that I tried to sort of concentrate more on uh, improving my game. So therefore I put more into it. Right. Because in 1982, 1983, I just went out there and it di I didn't bother about the game. I enjoyed playing it. So therefore I just turned up and I, and, right. and I did what I felt was, was I enjoyed. Right. Now in 1980, after 1985, I was actually trying harder. Too hard. I was practicing more. I was, uh, I was concentrating more. And I think that was, the, that was the one thing that I shouldn't have done. And my style changed slightly. Because I was putting more into it, I went in a different direction. So do you think you were playing? So therefore, my cue action slowed down a bit. Right. And it got to a point where I ended up with that problem that uh, Eric Bristow had, and I know... Patsy and Fagan And had. Patsy Fagan had. Oh, so you, you got I went yips, through all. I, really? went, I went through all that, yeah. I suffered that in for two, three years. Not being able to let go of the cue. And, not, and I, I, I actually understand why it happens now. So you're trying too hard? No, it's, it, it's a focal point. There's a, the, our sport is actually um, it's governed by what you see. Yeah? You look at the balls, you look at the table, and you know that that picture of the table is an imprint in your memory. Right. And you are only as good as actually what's, what you've done before because you keep relaying that information yep. into your brain. So the picture you see is the picture you're playing. It you tells your arm to do the shot and release the cue. Right. But when you actually over-concentrate, you, you, you get on the table, you look at the cue ball, you look at the object ball, and your eyes are the one that governs from the cue ball to the object ball and backwards and forwards. Because I get asked, asked this quite a lot. Amateur snooker players, they come and say, w you know, which ball do you look at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say, which ball do you look at when you strike the ball? Well, the answer is you don't really, people are different. But I didn't, I tried to think about that and I, I didn't look at any. And it worked? Well, no, it, it was because I got down on the table and I, I just used to look at the object ball. Right. And then look at the cue ball where I was going to hit it. And then once I'd started to deliver the cue, the imaginary table in your head is the one that takes over because you sort of switch off. And you actually then aim the spot that you want. But you don't really see this ball, the white ball. No, you're tuned in. Because, you, because you're looking now, you already know you're going to hit. It's like an automatic thing takes over. So once you've got some... Once you've got... It's a mechanism. Once you've got, um, uh, in a way, you know... But if you have a, a breakdown in the mechanism, right. from hitting the cue ball to the object ball, you, what was happening, and it's the same probably with Patsy Fagan, you look at the object ball, then you look at the cue ball, and then you keep... You look back up at the object ball, but the more you concentrate, mm -hmm. the more you, you focus on that one ball, and then you focus back on the other ball, you never come to see the two balls slightly out of together to release right. the cue. So and your brain keeps going over and over and over and over. And you get and slower no, and slower. And there's no release point. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, you know, it doesn't know when to say fire. <laughs> so that, that is a result of, of outside attention on you as an individual yeah. coming in that you then felt as if you were under scrutiny. Yeah. Probably. And, and the, the end result of that is you felt as if you had to do something with your game or you, you threw yourself into your game. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd sort of lost a few matches because in 1984, when I played the World Championships, when the article appeared, I, I got beat with, uh, with John Parrott, who was another new face right. on the who scene. Right, didn't have the worries. Didn't, no, he was just a new face coming in. And uh, I got beat with, with uh, Parrott. Now, that was the start of his, his career. <laughs> Now.
Neither of us are, are, are winning snooker tournaments. Yes. Okay. Regardless of where ranking position is, because mm. there's nothing wrong with being 93rd in the world. There's, no, there's no. two or three hundred fantastic snooker players out there. there. We all know of, that. There's a lot of good talent out okay. there. Okay. So what are we doing wrong? Are we trying too hard? Um, probably. So uh, how do we not try too hard? It's can't because technically what happens is you're picking up on the, all the errors that you've actually made over the last few years when you've lost tournaments. Right. So from 1984 when I start to lose matches, them negatives are being stored up here. Can you not get your confidence back? Well, you, or is it not confidence? I, f I, f I feel as though it's an hard road for, a, for a, any professional sportsman yeah. to travel up the ladder again that he's actually gone in the first place. Yeah. Because on the way on the way down from the height that you've travelled or the, you know in your career, you've taken some back. You've taken you've taken the negatives, especially a boxer would ne you know once the boxer starts getting beat with with uh, them that negatives are actually there, the timing disappears because the fear's there, the fear of the fear of pressure is a fear of failure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't you sound good for me here, Tony. You're not selling me a good story, <laughs> mate. I want some help. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. no, no the, the what, you're, is... what you're saying now is you're, no, you're actually... No, what do we do What you're get... asking me now, because you're actually in this position no, that sorry, I've been in we... a few years ago... What do we do, then? ...to, okay. to actually counter Well, yeah, what, did you, what are you trying to do? What should I do? Well, the, the, what I tried to do was to travel back up the ladder again and get rid of all the negatives. But, that's, but you can't get rid of the negatives. You see, when you actually started your career... Yeah. All you saw is one rung at a time. Who was next on the ladder? Mm -hmm. Bang. Get rid of him and we'll take his position. Get rid of the next person and travel up this ladder, which you did in the 80s, and you stayed there. You stay there. You may have had a nick up for a couple of years, Yeah. which is, which is when you actually reach that height, everybody else is trying to take your position. And then but you're, in, you're, you're, not, you're invulnerable because you're strong. You're, 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 you're only as strong as, obviously, what you've... I mean, you built up a tremendous uh, amount of confidence around you in the, in the late 80s from, from all them tournaments that you won. Right. And you got this barrier... From, from winning tournaments, you had, a, you had a great air of confidence about you, which was your strength yep. in your game. And um, what happened, what I feel is, is happening in your game is, and I suppose Terry Griffiths has told you this earlier, is, is that you played the game from the latter stages of the frame. Possibly, like Ray Reardon used to. Yes, and you used to control the game, and when you felt it was the right time to make your move, you then made your move and took control of the table. Right. And once you had control, it was very hard for your opponent to get back in. But that game, the game isn't being played that way now, is it? Straight for, oh, No, you've got to it's win. Actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You actually break off now in you, the game. And you've lost. <laughs> and, and you actually make a, you think, do I take... No, this is the... You start off now and you look at the table and you think, there's a red sitting up there, but my... Perce you know, the, this is where the, the shot percentage, which your brain is working on, Mm -hmm. You might not know it, but your brain is working out that percentage rate of that shot. Right. Now, is your opponent working out that percentage rate of that shot in taking it on? No. Not if he's 18 years old. Exactly. So he's got no fear of right. that shot. And his percentage rate, even though your percentage rate of getting that shot might be more than his, your success rate in getting that shot, knowing full well that you have the failures there... Right. It turns out less. So, so the longer you're in a, in, a, in a sport, the more likely you're going to be frightened, in a way. Well, it, it's just so, a, it's age, Steve, isn't it? Okay. It's not saying that your game has deteriorated. So it hasn't. what about Stephen Hendry? 34. I think he'll compete very well, knowing full well that he, he knows... He's obviously learned a bit about himself because he went through, a, he went through that bad, bad spell that you went through and, and you recovered from it. 41. Some people don't recover from that spot and they sort of quickly deteriorate. 42. 49.
Fifty. Hanging on to it. Fifty-seven. Sixty-six. Well, Suffolk Cannon opening up those two reds straight on the pink. Five reds left, sixty-seven points. Seventy-two. And <coughs> is sixty-eight points in the lead, so safe now. Seventy-three. Two examples from different eras of players who play so naturally that, in a way, I'm envious of them. I'm sure you know we mm. all are in many respects. Joe Johnson Joe in Johnson's 1980, a great player. 86 in the World Championship, played the most naturally gifted snooker I've yes, seen for ages. Yeah, and today, we, of course, we've got Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ron, Ronnie, Ronnie's like a, 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 another player with all the shots in the world. And he's got uh, no fear. And he's got no fear. But I think the difference is now that he can actually play that style on these tables because he's grown up on these tables. <laughs> but had he, have, had he have been using that style on the older table, it would have been very hard to carry the, his style and, and transfer it to the modern table. Mm. And the other thing is, um, with Ronnie's game especially, that he, with the reason he blows hot and cold is it... it, it once that time, that time in, it, it's very hard to get on these tables. So therefore, it only comes, and goes. It, it, it comes and goes. And when it's there, he's brilliant. And when it's not there, he's frustrated. Yeah. You so, I, I can certainly vouch for being frustrated on the snooker table if you don't. Yeah. Perform. Well, I assume you're in a similar situation. Yeah, I, I, I'm getting frustrated at the moment because I, at the, because I've got a style and I, and it can't, I can't really connect with the table that I'm playing on at the moment. Okay, so... The match play table. Right, you're, you're 40... 44. 44. Well, I mean, <laughs> the pin-ups, they age very well. How many years are you going to give yourself banging, banging against what is now ah. not a brick wall, but banging against a very high standard? How many years will you give yourself to, to get back in the top 32, I, 64? I, Before you say, well, look, <laughs> what else do you... What, you can't do any more than try? Um. I suppose if I, if I wasn't, I don't, en I don't enjoy the snooker that's being played, or the snooker that I'm playing especially, to, to try and get back into it. And that's probably why I'm not doing so well. Um, but I still want to go out there. I mean, I love, the, I love snooker and I love the game. So I'm still going to go out there and compete in, uh, until I probably disappear off the main circuit. Uh, I'll probably end up on the seniors tour when they start it with you, Steve. <laughs> well, that's probably going to end up in the, the seniors tour. It'll be good fun, I think. We'll have to we'll have to start it all over again in another era. Well, that'll be good fun to do that. Look, Tony, it's been a pleasure. It's been very interesting talking to you. Get inside the psyche of a snooker player, and a lot of things you said there have hit home to me as being very, very true. So, well, it, you know, going back over the, uh, um, I mean, it started for me, and it comes so quickly. You get you get caught in this era. I mean, you've not you, you've got next year to go through through yet, which is you're caught in 17 to 32. And, and to be quite honest with you, um, unless they change the system, which it has been changed slightly, because you've not got all these 700 players competing down. Yeah, well, that's you know you. I mean, if you go back six seven years and I was playing all qualifiers at Blackpool. I just got caught. I was number 17 in the world, and uh, I went to Blackpool, and you, you're playing some guys have played 50, 60 matches. And your first match. And it's your first match. You can't, you, they, they don't realise exactly what they've, they've done. These players are, are, are only that far off you. Mm. You know, you, they, they probably can play every shot you can play. Well, 
good luck getting back into the top part of the game. And, and uh, yeah. if, if uh, the performance you put in against me to beat me 10-1, if you can recreate that, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you're going to go I'm, a long I, way. I don't think we can play that sort of safety anymore, Steve. <laughs> well, it's been so, a pleasure. Very interesting. Very Fascinating Steve, yeah. chat. Thank you. Cheers, Dan.